As a recreational diver, I'm aware of the potential impact of diving activities and especially disruption of the coral reef ecosystem. Recently, I became aware that also the sunscreen I use might have an effect on the coral reef ecosystem. Some sunscreens allegedly have chemicals in it with endocrine, hormone-disrupting chemicals. On top of that, some part of the diving gear contains plasticizers like phthalates, also suspected of endocrine-disrupting properties. And then, a colleague of mine explained, there is a difference between endocrine activity and endocrine disruption. Yes, this is getting rather complex. Therefore, I'm happy to discuss this sensitive topic with Magdalena Mihova from EPA and Andy Adams from Bayer. Welcome. But before we start, also for Magdalena and Andy, the question, what were you doing in 1996? Well, thank you. It's a simple question and simple answer. I was studying European law in Paris. And Andy? And it was not quite so pleasant. It was a very disruptive year, 1996. It was the year we learnt that uh, the site where I was working was going to be closed and the R&D facility would be moved from the UK to Germany, which uh, for, with a young family, that was quite a, it was quite a memorable year. Okay, so for you, a disruption and for you, some nice activities in Paris. The EU is now currently looking into science-based criteria like potency, for instance, but it's also a controversial criteria, Magdalena. It is, but of course, uh, potency is one of the elements uh, for hazard uh, characterization. There are many others that uh, have been taken into account in Europe. Uh, what is more important that uh, behind the work that is ongoing on developing the different criteria for endocrine disruptors, there is also a very concrete regulatory work uh, with actions that are taken in the context of the CORUP, so the substance evaluation. Andy, can you clarify a little bit more for me what the difference is between endocrine activity and endocrine disruption? Well, very simply, if you walk out into the road in front of a car and the car sounds its horn, then you're going to get a shock of adrenaline and you're going to react. Uh, and assuming you react in time, then after a little while your body will sort of settle back down to normal and then it's a completely reversible effect. So there's been some activity in response to a stimulus, but it settles back to a normal state. When you have something which is disruptive, then it interferes in an adverse way and an irreversible way. So that there's been an interaction and that has consequences that are no longer reversible. That's really the, the, the fundamental difference. Among others, uh, Magdalena, Danish scientists are promoting to include OECD test protocols now with endocrine disrupting uh, tests. What is your view on that? Well, at, Europe, at European level, there's some pushes indeed from some of the Nordic countries because this, the phthalates, are, as you mentioned, rightly so, are one of the national priorities, so they're more focused on developing further tools. But at international level, there are already existing tools that are quite appropriate. The question is how all these tools are used. And it's very important to continue in the risk uh, assessment mood in order to have a realistic and efficient regulation in Europe. I think it's inevitable that there will be uh, attempts to get more, as, as certainly as more become available. Um, we understand a lot more about the endocrine system now. We have guideline studies for more of the endocrine system now. But I think it's important that it's done in, a, uh, in an intelligent way. Um, you have a toolbox and you can add more and more tools to that toolbox. The important thing is that you pick and choose the right tools on a case-by-case -case basis. Magdalena, the current approach um, is mainly hazard-based. Um, can you explain a little bit about the difference between a hazard and a risk-based approach in relation to endocrine? Yes, so the, the hazard base is really focusing the regulatory actions on the characteristics, the hazard characteristics, while actually the risk uh, based approach is taking into account the exposure and other elements. So far the experience has been very cautious in Europe and uh, the, the approach very conservative as to how to apply those criteria in practice and guidance have been developed on uh, negligible exposure. But we have to have in mind as well the fact that in Europe companies are also very proactive uh, in innovation and research in that area and very uh, efficient systems have been developed as well exactly to protect, to protect human health. And, and for industry, how difficult is it that in different regions they have different approaches, risk-based and hazard-based? Uh, it has uh, tremendous implications. Uh, if we look at the way in which the EU legislation is uh, worded now for pesticides, uh, the implications are that if a substance is excluded, um, then that substance is subject to uh, what we call a default uh, maximum residue limit which effectively sets the import tolerance to 
close to zero. That means that if the substance is still approved for use in other countries, or it may have major uses in other countries and only minor uses uh, in Europe, then those products which have been treated can no longer be imported. Uh, and so you have a potential uh, significant trade issue there when supposedly under WTO obligations, your MRLs, your maximum residue limits, should be addressed via risk assessment. Returning to the example of uh, the sunscreen, what is the real health benefit and what is done to protect the public? You're talking about tiny amounts that might have an effect if they were very, very large amounts. Uh, but the purpose of the product in the first place is to protect you from UV light. Uh, so there's obviously a benefit there. You don't get sunburned, you have a reduced risk of skin cancer and so on. Um, now, if on the flip side, there is something in there which presents a risk, that has to be also evaluated. But if that risk is so tiny or so, that it's not going to occur in real life, then you get the benefits and you avoid the risks. If we think about the pesticides, then we've got tools which are important for farmers. They're only approved if they're bringing benefits to farmers, which means they're, they're protecting their crops, they're ensuring our food supply, food security. Uh, if you want to take something like that away from a farmer, then you should have a good reason. And if there is a good reason, that's fair enough. If there's a real health concern, it should be regulated accordingly. But if there isn't a real health concern, it's just some hypothetical thing that might happen at doses which are never actually going to appear in real life, then you're potentially removing something useful with no uh, benefit whatsoever. Uh, what is really very important is to uh, have uh, efficient regulation. Efficient regulation means to address, to address the problem, but also to identify the right source of the problem. And this is what is lacking in the recent years. We see a lot of substance bans which are driven purely by uh, political priorities or non-substantiated uh, scientific claims. So what is really important is not to stigmatize the debate like it was happening already in the area of nano, but to find the right reason for degradation of environment or degradation of, of health and to address it with strict measures. Thank you very much for making this topic a little bit less complex for me at least. And thank you for this refreshing dive in some of the details of the endocrine disrupting chemicals. Thank you.